I think we are live streaming. If someone could give me the, the thumbs up, I think we are. One, okay. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I think we are live streaming now, uh, having had that thumbs up. Uh, welcome. A very brief introduction from me. My name's Ken, Ken Neal, the Dean of the School of Arts and Humanities. A warm welcome. This is the first in our forthcoming series of SOA Research Presents, uh, open to the public, SOA being School of Arts and Humanities. This evening's event is a combination, some uh, intrepid people in real life in the, the auditorium here in Battersea, and then a number online uh, uh, watching the live stream. Uh, gradually, I hope that we'll get back to in-person public uh, engagement around these lectures, uh, but I'm very pleased indeed that we have one launching this evening to get going again. I'm not going to say post-pandemic, but uh, having had such a challenging time with the pandemic, it's great to see you in person. I want to pass to Jasper Joseph Lester, who is Head of Programme for Sculpture here at the, the RCA and to thank Jasper for piecing uh, this evening's event together. And Jasper will introduce the speakers. Jasper, over to you. Um, thanks, Ken. Evening, everyone. Thanks for coming along. Just a quick introduction to tonight's speakers. Um, Barbara Hulub and Paul uh, Rajakovic founded Transparadiso in 1999. They received the Austrian National Art Award in 2018 and the Otto Wagner Urban Design Prize in 2007. Barbara Hulup, who is just sitting here in front of us, um, was the first female president of the Secession Vienna um, and is a member of the Innovation Fund for Culture in Public Space, Stuttgart. Um, Barbara also teaches at the University of Applied Arts in Vienna and currently directs the flagship project in Chemnitz, uh, We Para Pom. Um, Barbara is also external examiner for MA Situated Practice. We wouldn't normally mention the role of external examiner in uh, an introduction like this, but in this instance it's quite important because this talk is developed around a new research cluster we're developing titled Situation pra um, Situated Practices as opposed to Situated Practice. Uh, we, we've kind of invited Barbara and Paul to talk tonight in, as a way of helping us to kind of flesh out this term, which obviously is general. Um, it's, for us, it's a sort of vessel to get started with thinking about uh, the research direction or some of the aspects of our research direction in the school and it, it will be something that we can return to when we get to um, questions at the end of the talk. Paul Rye Jakovich is a member of the editorial board of, uh, of the um, Derive magazine. Um, it's a magazine for urban research in Vienna and lectures at the Vienna University of Technology. I got to know Tra Transparadiso through the research network SpaceX, which is an EU-funded four-year project. Um, SpaceX stands for Spatial Practices in Art and Architecture for Empathetic Exchange. Um, and this, this project allowed me to get a first-hand insight into the kind of work that Barbara and Paul are involved with in Vienna and also in Chemnitz. And I got to see directly how they have developed their work around these themes of direct urbanism, but also what they call silent activism. So in this talk, Transparadiso will consider a series of recent projects um, uh, around these very terms. The first uh, project is um, titled Times of Dilemma, uh, which was a project for Malta, City of Culture, uh, 2018, um, and the Third World Congress of the, um, of the Missing Things, which is part of normal direct urbanism, um, and that was in Graz in 2020. Um, they will also talk about the Harbour of Cultures, and that was um, situated in Trieste quite recently. So could we have a very warm welcome for Trans Paradiso? Thank you.
Thank you very much, Jasper, um, for the introduction and also for the invitation to give a lecture here at the RCA. We're delighted to meeting you in presence. It's um, like a new experience again after this long time, and we have to practice again this experience, I think. So Jasper already mentioned, but we will talk um, about um, this evening. We'll give you a short introduction to what we consider artistic strategies, um, what we call artistic strategies, and highlight three of them, which are quite important for the projects um, uh, we've been working on ever since we founded Transparadiso in 1999. And then we will show you four projects, which are all situated in very different contexts um, between shrinking and growing. And in the end, I think we'll have enough material to discuss what might be helpful and fruitful for discussing what situated practice could mean for the RCA or situated practices, as um, Jasper mentioned it. I will start and then I will hand over to Paul. So direct urbanism um, is actually the starting point of our practice together. When we founded um, Transparadiso, uh, we both came from different angles, Paul being trained as an architect and acting as an urbanist, really with the term urbanist. and. I also studied architecture, but um, was really working as an artist already when I was um, um, finishing my, my diploma thesis. What united our interests was to deal with urban issues and how artistic urbanistic strategies could engage in producing social space and reconsidering um, neoliberal urban development in considering how we can live together and actually completely adding a different angle. So we started working with those strategies even before we used that term direct urbanism. I think we used it for the first time in 2006 then. So what do we mean by that? The most important aspect of um, direct urbanism is to engage artistic strategies um, for dealing with unplanned situations, with the unplannable conditions of our current situation in society, our current political situation. Now we are facing the, I mean, we've all been confronted with um, um, the best example during the last two years, I think two years ago, or when was it two and a half years ago, nobody would have expected um, such a dramatic event where all of a sudden we could not deal with whatever we have learned before anymore. We were exposed to completely shifting our our angles. And this is something we, we have been experiencing in, in, in planning as well. And at the same time, the role of art has changed at least what we consider the role of art or the type of art we're working with in, in, in our practice, a type of art that tries to address um, societal issues. So the term direct urbanism actually relates directly to direct action. It produces situations for direct engagement, often returning responsibility to people on site. And I think this is also um, something we will come back um, Again, tonight, how to act in a situation of despair, of possible helplessness and hopelessness now again under the new political situations. Um, the three strategies I would like to mention um, are anticipatory fiction, macro utopia, and then the production of desires. They all work with how to produce fiction, how to not limit ourselves to what is given to given circumstances, but to transgress borders in our thinking, borders in what we can imagine, and believing in the impossible. So the production of desires is maybe the most complex of those um, uh, strategies. You will see two examples in, in the project um, 
Normal, Third World Congress of the Missing Things, and also in Harbor for Cultures, where we explicitly worked with them, the production of desires, but of course there are many other projects in our in our practice um, where we use that technique. Uh, maybe you know the project Park Fiction, which Christoph Schäfer and Kathy Skeen um, um, uh, started to work on in, in 1995, and actually they were th the first ones who, who coined that term in the art context. And we called it um, the mother, uh, Park Fiction, the mother of the production of desire. And Christopher always smiles when he reads that. But I think it's um, uh, quite important to mention that. Um, yeah, then sometimes um, we sit in a trap. We realize that um, with all our engagement for uh, trying to employ the methods of direct urbanism also in a planning context, we were exposed to a lot of, um, of course, um, barriers um, due to um, conventional planning methods. And then at a certain moment, I decided that maybe I should approach those problematics um, from another angle. And I started a research project, which I called um, Planning Unplanned. Um, can art have a function towards a new function of art in society? trying to look um, at academic research, collecting examples, uh, showing and extracting um, the artistic strategies we've been develop developing, and yes, putting together um, that publication, which we also brought you here. And during that research project, I also developed this um, term of um, an urban practitioner, which means a transdisciplinary practice, because we think, and I think this is something we already discussed with Jasper in several discussions already, that due to all those challenges we're facing, it's not enough anymore to be trained in one field, but we really have to collaborate with them. Um, um, experts from other fields, and maybe the role of an artist is itself has become a very transdisciplinary role already. And that's why I think that this um, quote by Antanas Mokos is, is very inspiring. Antanas Mokos, um, he's a philosopher. He was the director of the University um, of Bogota, and then he became the mayor of Bogota. He was introduced to the art context um, by Joanna Warsha for the Fifth Berlin Biennial, and he um, he uh, said um, when during the when he was interviewed um, during the Berlin Biennial, he said, "When I sit in a trap, I behave like an artist," and I really love that because it shows that you don't have to be an artist um, in order to think and act like an artist and employing artistic strategies. So Jasper actually said we should keep the title of our talk very short. So I eliminated all possible subtitles. I also eliminated silent activism, but he still encouraged us to talk about silent activism. And I think it's uh, the first time that we really try to relate silent activism to direct urbanism in a talk. Um, what do I consider silent activism? I think it's this, how can I say, reluctance to follow or promote activism in a direct sense. I'm quite suspicious, and now in this case I'm saying I, because Sometimes Paul and I will also have different positions within Transparadis, and we can discuss that later as well. But uh, what I really find interesting, and in when we create situations for public engagement, for addressing societal issues, when we create those artistic um, frameworks addressing specific contexts, when we invite people to participate in those contexts, I'm very much interested in maintaining that uh, a certain kind of um, confidential situation where I would never ever ask people to follow some rules, to obey, to, to be part of a larger, let's say, propaganda or anything. But I, con I really consider those artistic situations um, a possibility for them to experience 
something new, to experience themselves in a, in a different role, and to transgress their personal borders. And oftentimes what happens is they participate in those projects. And I imagine or I think that many of their experiences, they will resonate afterwards. So it's not about this immediate, uh, let's say, result or um, impact that the experience of art or of participating in a project by Trans Paradise or Barbara Hollow would have, but it's like this building up a longer term process. And when we think about um, how to promote uh, more of a um, society of caring, I think when we start caring about how individuals can make individual other experiences, then those small experience and moments uh, can also pile up to larger, how can I say, um, moments of possible uh, change. And this leads us directly to normal, a project we realized for Graz Culture Year in 2020, it was a very specific situation because um, Graz had been European capital of culture in 2003. It was a big, big event. Then afterwards, there were a few years of um, a kind of a um, bit of a depressed situation because all of a sudden there was no more money in the city. But then, in the long run, the city of Graz realized that actually the city of culture had had a really long-term impact, that the city uh, turned into the fastest growing city in Austria, very lively, very diverse art scene, very strong transformation also of the city. And that was, I think, one of the reasons why uh, the mayor decided to hold the Graz uh, Culture Year 2020, and he explicitly asked artists to develop um, perspectives and visions. How do we want to live together in the next 20 years? And I think it's, I mean, at least what I know, it's the first time that a city asks artists what they consider, and they actually provided a quite good budget. So we took that um, uh, call to the artists or question um, very literally and actually addressed a uh, problematic that is coming along with um, a growing city, transformation processes on the fringes, on the borders, on the outskirts, which in Graz happened to come along with um, non-planning, non-being um, part of uh, any kind of urban development plan, but the idea is really to sell off parcels of agricultural land, of field, to investors which um, build um, the, um, how can I say, the largest uh, floor area they can, they can manage to gain maximum profit, which results in a loss of uh, communal spaces, of spaces um, where people would meet informally. And that's why we decided to, um, to select four districts, one in the north, in the east, in the south, and in the west which are facing similar processes of, of transformation, but with um, still very different moments. And we invited three other practices, um, international practices, acting in a similar field as Trans Paradiso, working with similar methods, but yet having different types of aesthetics as well, how they approach those situations. Um, one you probably know, it's based in London, Public Works, Andreas Lang and Solange Ponsari, and actually Andreas was the one uh, who participated or who developed the project for, for Graz. Horizontale from Rome, uh, Georg Winter from Saarbrücken, and we offered them to select a district and prepared an in-depth research with questions, with issues that were already triggering conflicts in the city, and we then dedicated ourselves to the fourth district. The idea of the project was to, to have a communi communication between the city center and the fringes, because um, what often happens in mid-sized cities like Graz is that the cultural institutions accumulate in the city center, 
and there are no other art or cultural institutions on the fringes. And usually people on the fringes have a hard time coming to the city center to even attending those, um, uh, those venues. So we started with presenting the research um, before artistic practices at an exhibition at the House of Architecture in the city center. Then the four projects were realized in the four districts and in the end um, the experience of realizing the four projects was transported back into the city center to an exhibition at Forum Stadtpark. So here we see um, Andreas' um, project with the School for Civic Action. He selected Andret's main square and realized that this main square actually had no quality of staying there because it was more like a traffic knot. So he referred to the School of Civic Action and already started to collect desires for what the, um, uh, what the square could be. He installed that tower and here he also uses that quote, in order to expand the possible, it is important to wish for the impossible. Dan's Plant Plan by Georg Winter selected a site, a field belonging to the agricultural school in the west of Graz, which had become the kind of signifier of the problematics of this transformation process on the fringes. The school sold that field uh, to a housing company because they needed money for creating, for building a new stable. At the same time with <laughs> selling off that field, it's like undermining the basis of <laughs> what they are um, dedicated to, to do, to research how an ecologically orientated um, agriculture could contribute to our city climate and our, yeah, our qualities of, um, of, of life. So he, Georg Winter, founded the Stance Plant Plan Agency and addressed those issues also with some um, performative elements, collaborated with the residents um, living in those um, um, housing areas. And the beautiful result of that project is that now, again, resonating after one year, there's the interest of the neighbors that um, they would like to continue with the field. And the head of the district offered to give a field to, to Georg and his group to continue with the project. One of the main concerns of the projects was to include the question of um, agriculture on a small basis, of farming on a very small basis, of making use of the greenery in new housing areas for growing vegetables or fruits, rather than only having that kind of what we call distance green in, in Austrian law. The distance green is the, the minimum green you have to, to, to install in order to keep the distance to the next building, which usually is completely unused and doesn't have any kind of landscaping or, or nature qualities. Yeah, he's doing it there in a very performative manner. This is for sure the dancing with, 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 with that, and it's a perform performative uh, act. The third project, um, Fluss Fluss, uh, Cast Away on the Moor by Horizontale, um, was actually a really big success because they managed to install it already on a, on a permanent level. They addressed the issue of um, a new water power plant being constructed along the River Moor. There have been heavy protests um, against this um, complete change of the landscape. At the same time, the city of Graz promised to install a beach and actually make the beach accessible to people for free for everybody in an area which is um, a bit, let's say, socially underprivileged in Graz. If that exists at all in Graz, then it's that area. 
and what flus flus um, what horizontale did was mm, creating those um floating islands and they were not directly orientated towards a specific function then there was a public film screening and the whole project happened in collaboration with the youth center so that the young people living in that area were involved in the whole process right from the beginning and it created a landmark here as you can see there was a collaboration with um, a person a boat rental and that was a very nice negotiation process right from the beginning that we said okay this series of islands by horizontale should be installed and how could he let's say step back a little bit with his marketing of the boat rental which was um this um uh, inflatable bananas or whatever where people have to pay actually kids are again kids the two uh, two um uh, the ropes? ropes where they can uh, 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 take this one island to the other and people immediately have uh, taken that over and were very happy to, to play with them and partly they really built them by, by, the, by themselves that up so they helped with the hammer and uh, painting the, 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 their project mm -hmm. Yeah, and the fourth project was the Third World Congress of the Missing Things by Transparadiso, where we transformed a parking lot of a church, um, which already looks as a congress center, like um, a meeting place, a very specific architecture um, by um, Styrian architect Ferdinand Schuster from, from 1970. We worked with the Congress of the Missing Things in order to collect, let's say, to produce a reverse collection of desires. As you can see, the priest was the opposite of being, let's say, innovative, um, um, forward thinking. He was very conservative. And I point this out because I think it's very important when we talk about this type of projects that we are very much interested in collaboration all the time, more in the sense of Grant Kester to really look at dialogue and to work also with people whom you usually might maybe consider, quote unquote, the enemy coming from a completely different background, promoting complete or having completely different interests. But we're really convinced that we need to approach exactly those people if we want to change something. So the beautiful experience with them um, and this priest was that when we approached him for the first time and everybody had warned us and said, look, I mean, you won't be able to get in touch with him. Nobody can talk to him. He's so difficult. I mean, he's he's like, I mean, nobody wants him. Uh, nobody even wants to take him because this parish already wanted to get rid of him, but then no other parish offered to take him. So we understood that there was really this long, long history in the background. And then we met him when he was walking in the park um, praying and we just approached him and asked him and to a big surprise he said immediately well let's sit down and talk this sounds really interesting and even though I don't understand anything of art that sounds interesting let's do that congress and it was a really really great event um, we made several tariffs for exploring hidden qualities in the area. The parish um, is situated in, in, in an area of, uh, of Graz um, with housing from the 1960s, meaning that in the 1960s there was still plenty of open space, large greenery, luxurious moments, as you can see here. Yes. I think I want to add, this is a little bit like the topic of Robin Hood Gardens here in London. It was there's a of the of the post war it's a post war development and uh, there's a high quality and people it is it is it was very important to work with those qualities which are not so seen it's only when they when they when they are gone then then you see that that there were uh, there are a lot of qualities and this is what this area uh, offers. Yeah, and what was very what is increasingly important for for us is 
to highlight non-functional qualities because we're so much used to this uh, dictate of our society to be efficient, to function, to not waste anything. And I think that it's not a waste to look at poetic moments of things that actually provide us with different emotional qualities and those cannot be planned with conventional methods. So here you have the collection of the missing things. We put together this charter of the missing things. And I have to say that the Third World Congress of the Missing Things is not related to being situated in the Third World. Graz is not the Third World, but it's the Third Congress of the Missing Things. And I started to work with the missing things in a situation in Baltimore in 2014. So it's very much about using the method of a Congress for giving credits and justice to knowledge production, which comes from non-experts, from people who would usually not be considered to be able to produce knowledge. And in the sense, of course, the Congress of the Missing Things questions who decides which knowledge is relevant and who decides which knowledge should be considered and taken into account for our development of the city, of the society. And as I already mentioned, in the end, we collected uh, different moments and pieces and objects and things that were produced in the four districts and showed them in the Forum Stadtpark. And then the miracle of Graz happened. Um, the, um, the new elections in September happened and to all our surprise, Graz has elected a communist mayor, and this was the result of the new liberal planning policy of the former mayor. Actually, the topics we had addressed in Normal in the project were one of the main, main reasons why the communist mayor LKK won. So it was this, let's say, unexpected um, um, coincidence, but she had really, the Communist Party in Graz had worked on engaging for socially underprivileged people, for social housing, for really providing uh, social moments for the city for more than 20 years. So it was in a way a very logical outcome, but still unexpected. So now I will so. hand over <laughs> to Paul. Well, the next project is in, uh, situated in Trieste. Trieste is a, a city, um, an Italian city close to the Slovenian border um, in the northern Adriatic Sea. And we uh, started this pro project uh, together with Giuliana Capri and Peter Borro. They're both uh, from, uh, from Trieste and Juliana is running a, 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 a gallery de Trieste Contemporanea. Well, uh, the, as you see, the, 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 there's an old hub. There's a, the, 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 you can see, yeah. There's this old, uh, old city here. It's a, it's a development of the 18th century when the first time uh, Trieste grew. And this, this is uh, the old harbor, which was built up in the uh, late uh, 19th century uh, in the phase where Trieste belongs to the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. And Trieste was the most important harbor. But this harbor is abandoned, or more or less abandoned, se 70 years. So it's very close to the city center, but it's a, it, w it was a free harbor. And of but, but because of that, it uh, was not possible to, to do another de uh, urban development. And since um, 10 years or 15 years, it is now a, a new law that they can develop, but it is only a neoliberal development that they try to get investors not thinking what they are doing, just buying, should, should sell, just selling uh, this this old uh, objects. And so we decided to do a new another harbor uh, another which with with uh, uh, social qualities, and uh, we developed together a system of of um, of a collection of the desires, uh, 
uh, first in in Venice with uh, where uh, uh, Peter Borrow started with the carte blanche, and uh, we later on uh, made an uh, an intervention in at the, at the old harbor. Uh, it's called uh, uh, shared values, ambulant gardens, and other spaces. And this is based on the on a text from Michel Foucault. Uh, other spaces, maybe you know the text, and there there he explains that the gardens uh, uh, is the, the 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 first the 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 old gardens is the first uh, idea of the world: the, the north, the south, the east, and the west. And the the carpet is the image out of that. Yeah, this is the the the, the where you have the where you in the center, and we we collected uh, 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 some carpets, used carpets. This was was very important for us in different sizes that we can can work with that, and asked uh, the the people to have desires for the old harbor on site that they take the carpet. Like, uh, yeah, the, the, you take the carpet and fi find a, 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 a spot where you ca where you have your best desire, yeah. And this worked very very well, and we got a lot of of uh, uh, you see a lot of a lot of wonderful uh, places where, where where people were where people ca came with desires, and they had a very very poetic uh, desires that they brought uh, us back, like. Um, some of them were very uh, politically, some were more individual, but some were very pragmatic for specific programs, and w which is also uh, was interesting was that was the how we we collected them. We had this uh, um, uh, cold 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 paper, carbon paper. Carb carbon, carbon paper. So you had to write down, and you get and get one, and the other we got. We got. So we had a, 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 a more than more than hundred uh, desires we collected, and the best one are maybe you you told them because I, I have always a, a My favorite one yes. is um, <laughs> the waiting room for tyrants, or a studio <laughs> for. But there is a modern <laughs> <laughs> studio yeah, for depressed uh, songwriters <laughs> uh, so, so, uh, uh, things like that yeah but also uh, for utopian sp spaces a lot of uh, wonderful ideas they had yeah and uh, we we then we put them also to for for a short <laughs> video together together with the with a with a with a uh, walk a walk with the boat uh, along the the a trip with the boat and then we brought that the, all the, the desires back to the exhibition hall, the Studio Tomasia from Julia, Juliana. And uh, uh, well, this is uh, one of one uh, Lungo for human values. I think this is launch for human values. I think this is uh, the, uh, the over title. And uh, finally, we decided to, to bring like to, to have more that the, the wishes will, uh, the desires will fulfill. We decided to golden uh, uh, um, a bit uh, uh, in, in, in on the on the harbor. We we we, we, we golden that, and uh, and then we had another exhibition in Graz with the, the with the project, and and this is now why we it's still going on. We now can try to get, and we are. On the, I think we got a, a, a little bit of this distance, a center for harbor for culture in the old harbor. It's a building who nobody wants, and uh, we want the, to, to do. Uh, we want to run uh, to develop an exhibition space, a library, a cafe together with Juliana, and of course an international artist resident, uh, resistance. This is Or maybe one last sentence to be added to, to the Harbor for Cultures project. Um, the project explored the figure of the harbor as an, rather than an exchange of good, as an exchange of values, of non-commercial values. And that's also the basis together with the collection of desires uh, for the Center for Harbor for Cultures that we're envisioning at the moment.
I will continue with um, Times of Dilemma, a project for the European Capital of Culture in Malta, Valletta, uh, 2018. We were invited by Marin Richter to produce an urban intervention for the island is what the sea surrounds, and Marin has known our work for many, many years, so she said, well, you have to deal with the aspect of utopia. So we said, okay, we will look at one island, which um, uh, is quite in harsh discussion at the moment in Malta, which is Manuel Island. And we look at this process of um, rapid transformation in, in Malta. I don't know, I think there is a very special relationship between the UK and Malta, so probably you're familiar about also maybe their in-flight magazine, which was quite um, interesting when we read this one article, full page announcement, how to acquire residency in Malta, how to acquire European passport. And if you add a little bit more of an investment, you can also acquire a green card for one of your kids to study in the United States. So there was like this quite upfront business plan, how to become a European citizen and how this is, let's say, a money-making machine. And during the time when we were there, uh, these, the very, how can I say, shocking uh, event happened when the journalist um, was murdered. Be she was the one who was really the first and big investigative journalist who wanted to uncover all the corruption going in Malta. Just to give you a little bit of the context in which the um, European capital of culture was, was situated. So we looked at Manuel Island. Manuel Island was a um, Lazaretto Island with four Manuel, as you can see here, huge four, sold to Midi private investor about 20 years ago. Um, Norman Foster and partners developed a luxurious master plan with private harbors. And then at a certain point, there was actually quite some resistance, protests going on. And that was the time when we started to, um, to work on this um, project. I added here some recent information from November 2021, because actually in the end, uh, Foster had to revise the master plan and concede more public space um, to, to the Maltese people. But that was um, three years after we did our project. So we looked into um, uh, traditional um, singing technique, traditional, very traditional Maltese folk culture, which was just about to die out. At the same time, it has already created a lot of, lot of interest among researchers. So there are researchers, academics, researching the different types of ana, that's the name of this tra traditional singing, whereas they would never attend the ana bars where ana is performed. So there is a huge divide, of course, um, between so-called folk culture and so-called high culture. Here you can see the house of a very famous um, ana singer, and Zeppi Espanol, and, and his wife Rose. They converted their garage into a living room for themselves because they offered their own apartment to their son who had just gotten married. So just to show you a little bit about the family um, responsibility in, in Malta, we organized workshops where we collected topics that the Maltese found relevant to be addressed because we wanted to use that technique of spontaneously improvised singing with a very clear verse um, number of syllabus, 13 syllabus per line, four lines per verse, and then the other side, two other aneya would start to sing after an interlude by guitar so that the other side would have enough time to, uh, to improvise. So we wanted to use that technique and connect it to um, scripted texts addressing today's social, urbanistic, um, emotional, 
um, issues of the Maltese population, and we wanted um, Maltese authors to collaborate with Yanea. So, for example, here you see Emmanuel Mifsud. Uh, I know that he had had um, a reading, a lecture, being invited by the Queen, for example. He's a really famous Maltese author. Yeah, some impressions of the Anna bars. You have to imagine it's like the pub, Sunday morning, drinks, tapas, and discussing via singing daily issues of their private lives and the community. And here you see one of the texts that was produced during that process, where you can see um, how harsh urban development issues are actually transformed in, into literature. And that was the script that was given to, um, to the Anea, who then performed across a distance of 320 meters between Valletta and Manuel Island. In order to do that. Yeah, and I want to add that, that the distance is, uh, was because of uh, in former days there was a chapel in, on, on, in, on the Valletta side and the Lazaretto, uh, the, uh, the uh, um, camp was of the, on the other side and when they were in quarantine, they, the priest uh, uh, didn't come to, 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 the, to the Lazaretto because uh, of, of a lepra or pest and, the, and they looked on the, on the side where, where the on, on Valletta and then Sunday they gave they got the, 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 the from the priest the, 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 the prayed uh, and uh, and this was exactly the same distance we did we, we, we developed those two objects the, the, the they, they could so that they clear he, they can hear from each side to the other side this megaphone it was of course with a special uh, uh, speaker uh, used. And I'll give you a short impression of what that sounded like. So he's He's standing over there, yeah. which is here. Behind that is the military camp, the 16th century. Well, you can see they're reading um, the text because they're not used to uh, memorizing texts. And that was also the reason why this one elderly Anna singer all of a sudden didn't show up anymore. And we were asking, well, why is Michelina not there anymore? Really one of the main figures. And then they told us, well, uh, she's illiterate, so unfortunately she won't be able to perform. And then we decided that we would give her the last moment of performance in her traditional singing every single time after the the three public events. So 
I have to say that I'm still touched by the project because um, transgressing those borders of the Anea, who usually don't sing scripted texts, they improvise, who usually really stick to their Ana communities. The famous authors on the other side that say really being open to collaborate with the Anea. That was really a great experience for everyone. And here you see why we think that this project is um, uh, quite important. Here you see what um, Malta themselves call Little Dubai. So it's the eradication of the Maltese roots. And as a last project, I will show for the first time Le Parapon, which is a project which I'm, I've been working on since one and a half years now for the European Capital of Culture, Chemnitz 2025. And maybe you're surprised that we're showing so many projects now, two out of four of uh, European Capitals of Cultures. I think it's no coincidence because the focus of the European Capitals of Cultures had changed, uh, I think, uh, four or five years ago. Now their main agenda is to really consider art and how artistic strategies can engage for social space and for the future living together of cities. So actually it really touches a um, main concern of um, my interest in, in art. And that's probably also why this project happened. I was invited and then after a workshop, um, this project um, was decided to become one of the flagship projects, one of the four flagship projects for, for Chemnitz 2025. I'm not sure who of you is familiar with Chemnitz, former Karl Marx city. Eastern Germany, next to Leipzig and Dresden. Leipzig blossoming, Dresden blossoming, Chemnitz not blossoming. As you can see here from the figures whom I added now, Chemnitz has about 244,000 inhabitants and it had 360 in the 1930s and it still had 315 after the reunification. So you can see they lost um, almost a third of inhabitants. It used to be the richest city in Germany around the turn of the 19th uh, to the 20th um, century. So you can imagine empty boulevards, empty quarters, quite depressive mood, which um, results from the feeling that they have just been left out after the reunification. Um, Still quite some hierarchical structures in thinking and in behaving. And that's why I think that this project will face or is facing also quite some big challenges. I have to say that the idea was not my idea. Planting 2000 apple trees was one of the ideas that was collected by Chemnitz residents in many workshops when they prepared the application period for, for the first bit book. And when I was invited uh, to participate in, in, in the workshops, the goal was to turn those ideas and frame them into art projects. And then I suggested to plant a parade of 2,000 apple trees, crossing borders, crossing borders of different social districts, connecting those different social districts, inviting people to provide their soil, their private garden, their public land, if it's public authorities or the municipality, to plant apple trees in locations also where it hurts. So we're not talking about planting apple trees in orchards or in alleys, but really cutting across parking lots, cutting across streets, um, looking at ecological issues, but also using the apple tree and also the figure of the parade. And of course, deconstructing the parade as a figure of the representation of power and using that parade of apple trees for installing artistic interventions and art projects addressing the topics like um, 
migration or labor conditions or of course one of the main topics the apple raises is the question of norm what fits what does not fit so we started with this um, information campaign last fall and It was the introduction for the first public appearance, first um, public art project. I don't even call them openings of an art project because it's really this ongoing process that will um, accumulate till 2025. In 2025, we will have a um, big exhibition where also the uh, artistic interventions will be shown, but also, um, of course, uh, other other art projects and pieces and a reflection from the cultural historical background. The first project was by Volker Köberling, who literally dug up soiled, uh, sealed soil. And I will show you a short um, uh, part of a video right in the end. It coincided with the first planting of apple trees in two schools. The one school was this one, the second, and here you see it a couple months later, and here you also see Jasper's site visit with Jonas Stahlberg and other artists who will come to produce projects for, for Chemnitz. The second public um, appearance were film screenings in a very central area, again connecting very diverse uh, locations like a uh, uh, Museum Gunzenhauser, okay, the main museum, but also, for example, Cafe Smart, which is um, uh, this one location. I have to see if I have uh, second planting. So here you see the Cafe Smart. It's um, uh, notorious for the so called silent middle, which is in the right wing um, people in Chemnitz. So we were right in the center. And here in the um, former supermarket, which I was hoping to be able to reuse as an art center at first as a project space for Viparapom and then turn it into an art center. And again, I had to face the fact now that it's a lost opportunity because it was given to the post office as a um, distribution center, the real waste of this wonderful location. And I think that's um, quite telling for the problematics in Chemnitz at the moment that um, Last time when I was there, actually two days ago, um, somebody somebody said, well, you know, the problem is um, that it, it was put together in one phrase by a Chemnitz artist who said, well, for Chemnitz, it's good enough. So that's the bottom line with which we are dealing at the moment to really reverse that. No, for Chemnitz, this is not good enough. That's what we have to work on. And here you see... Um, Volker Köberling's um, intervention um, at another school in a very different quarter in Chemnitz, very much underprivileged um, and the former second large, it's the largest um, slab housing project of the German Democratic Republic. I think there are hardly any German speaking uh, kids living there and so we chose deliberately right as the first event this location. And now I will show you how difficult it is to seal, I mean to de-seal, to unseal soil. And I think Volke herself was surprised because she had done it before. But this um, soil seemed to be even thicker than expected. So what you see here was the result of eight hours of work desealing manually. So what she wanted to, to show with this manual labor is how fast do we make decisions often without thinking of the consequences and how much energy and effort it takes to reverse those decisions.
think we would stop here. And thank you very much for your attention. Mm -hmm. so much for your talk your presentation hello everyone it's a it's a chance for us to have um, a bit of a discussion now to ask um, questions um, and also maybe to interrogate some of these themes around direct urbanism and what you call silent activism I wanted to maybe just start with um, uh, a kind of observation really just with regard to time scales because you know i got a good sense of your work from um italian feminists in vienna but um seeing you present just then i have this impression that the work that you produce doesn't really have an end date you know the, there's <laughs> there's a there's a kind of sense with all the projects that maybe they could continue forever the, and and i suppose that is interesting for me because you know, you talk about you, the importance of time in the work um, and, you know, um, with the trees, uh, with the kind of um, singing project, with pretty much all the projects, even when maybe they're not active, there's still a sense that you could pick them up and develop them further. Um, so maybe, I don't know, it would be interesting to hear you talk more about time in, and how important that is with relation to these concepts of or, or themes of direct activism. I think, uh, um, I think this is a very, learning. very good question yeah. because uh, um, we have not sometimes we show our first uh, uh, definition of direct urbanism, and there is mentioned that we that we have to work on both uh, both uh, sides of the short time and in the long time uh, development. The, the, that what we do immediately and to, to always always to think also on, on that what is in in, in, in in a longer longer period mm. yeah and this is also very related to that what what we can where where we are so the context from, from where we are and uh, these to have always in in in, vi in vision both long time and short time mm -hmm. I, I think always requires a long time to prepare the ground. That's where we start from, you know. So in order to prepare the ground seriously, to understand the context, this already takes time. Then it takes time to address people, to find out whom you want to involve. Um, then slowly, slowly, you can build up this kind of um, momentum where you hope that you can actually really achieve some kind of um, consciousness some kind of, some kind of engagement that will if it's a project um, which we're realizing in in the framework of direct urbanism then will also um, relate to urban planning or actually have a very direct impact on urban planning and urban development and urban development usually has a time span of the next 20 years so uh, i mean this short term mid term and long term is not a linear process but i think what is important about when we when we employ those short term artistic interventions is that they are able to react um, to very fast changing parameters so we can decide if the process continues, at which moment it would need maybe a next kind of um, not regulating, but addressing something that is missing or maybe changing a bit a direction which we think is not fruitful for the goal that was expressed right from from the beginning. Mm. It, it sort of seems interesting in relation to this idea of a kind of latent work you know, mm -hmm. something that might be sort of um, quietly, <laughs> quietly sleeping in, in <laughs> these infrastructures of cities and then it becomes at certain moments active. That the, there's a kind of movement between a, 
a, a, an intense period of activity and then a period of latency um, that um, establishes itself in an entirely different way to maybe other commissions, public commissions that sometimes appear to be an afterthought or something that's quickly turned around um, and not always spectacular necessarily, but the time frame is important. You know, this, and so I think, you know, in relation to this question of kind of impact um, mm -hmm. and, you know, the question of how these projects do have an impact on the com communities that they're part of, it's, it's really a question of time, isn't yeah. it? Um, and I wonder, you know, in terms of authorship too, you know, is it then free for others to pick up these works from their kind of moments of latency? You know, the, this, this kind of, I don't know, the fact that they are um, so still somehow present in these cities. Is, is there a way in which communities actually go back to them and take them on as their own at a later stage? Well, for, first of all, I love the term latency, <laughs> Jasper. <laughs> really beautiful. Yeah, I think it's it describes our this this kind of wave movement of our projects really, really well. And coming back to to the very concrete question, I mean, for example, with Malta, the megaphones were there. They were produced. It was an enormous effort. Uh, you have no idea. It looks very simple, but in order to really manage to catch that sound over that distance. I mean, already very, very slight movements, if they're not completely aligned, um, it wouldn't work. And then of course the wind plays a, um, his own role. So people- Especially in Malta. People mm -hmm. told us mm -hmm. that if they were taking the ship, I don't know, a kilometer further down, sometimes they would catch certain, certain parts of the transmission of, um, of the singing. So what we wanted to do right from the beginning, since it was such an effort to construct those megaphones, we wanted to hand them over to the community. We wanted to leave them in Malta. We invested a lot of energy in that part, trying to find communities who wanted to take them over. We created a manual with rules how the megaphones would be should be used, you know, not to be used for political propaganda. That's a very tangible issue in Malta. There are only two parties. And I mean, talking about, for example, we, we had this uh, follow-up project then on, on uh, Times of Dilemma, which we didn't mention now. Uh, no, no, w another one where we in were invited by a Maltese architect oh, who had yeah. helped us um, for the project. And when I was there for, on his invitation, he said, look, I mean, we're going to, and he invited us to show him how to make a production of desires. And he took us to, um, to a day center for senior citizens. And there was a sign on the wall saying, you must not, you're not allowed to talk about politics. Everybody talks about politics. And I mean, I mean that's what why you meet, right? You talk about politics. And then I, w I was really surprised. And then they explained to me, no, I mean, this divide between the two parties in Malta is so harsh that, I mean, families really start to fight each other, but not verbally, but really physically. So, so we put together that um, manual describing how the megaphones should be used for the uh, sake of the community, for, ex for an exchange of debates but not for fighting each other and, and so on. And you would not believe it, we did not manage to find anyone who wanted to take that over. Plus, then corruption comes into play again in Malta. All of a sudden, the megaphones Sorry. had disappeared. Um. Nobody knew <coughs> where the megaphones were anymore. Then we even turned to the... Um ambassador, the Austrian ambassador, the curator was still there, the head of the um, European Capital of Culture sent us in circles. Till today, no trace of our megaphones. Yeah, but we, we had the luck that we took the, took the amplifier by, with us by in, in our bag 
and this was the, the reason that we could do that again, but it was a lot of work and we had another project without having any money because we, we, we applied with the megaphones, uh, thinking that we have the megaphones, but we have to build them again. So it was quite a lot, and we did it by the, with my hand. Yeah. <laughs> But maybe to explain, to, to come back to... But yes, I, I want, uh, maybe I want to, to switch to the project in, in Le uh, Leeds. No, no, no. I would, I would like to explain, you know, the, yeah. let's say the second life of not only... I mean, the one aspect is leaving objects or leaving, handing over the situation to people on site. And the other aspect is to reuse objects in a different context. And I think both aspects mm. are important for, for our work. And then in the case of Malta, the idea was then after we could not find a community to hand over the megaphones um, in Malta, we decided to transfer them to a different situation, again, facing a border in Austria. And it's a border between upper Austria and lower Austria. And the border is situated exactly in the middle of the river Danube. It's a floating border, which I think also in a metaphorical sense is really beautiful. And that's the project for which we then built the megaphones again from scratch. Yeah, what I want to say, I think it's more this, the social aspect, I think you mentioned as well, with the people. I think some of the direct urbanism are failing in that sense. Yeah, we, we have project like in Hindenburg, which at, at the end we, we had a, a lot of hope. Yeah. But there is another project, the direct urbanism project in 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 Leeds, and also a small a small town, and there we uh, we did the project, and it was the first we did as direct urbanism, and at the end we we thought that we'll go on further for the urban development, and the city government not really react, and but the 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 the, the good thing is that. Two years ago, this is a very old project. We came uh, back to the site, and it is was in an, uh, an, um, an, an old um, um, uh, comment, uh, comments uh, where where uh, an orchard, uh, orchard, orchard, yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah. and it, uh, they say it is it's a city a city city park, but, uh, um, and after it was a total uh, uh, wasted land in a way. And after that, we have installed this project. It is now used really as that, as, as, a, as, a, as a garden. And this is what, what, we, what we really, so it, sometimes it happens not in that direct sense you, you expect, but there's, there's something which in we- long term In a long, a long term effect. So at, at the end, the, the, the object is, what was at the end, the pavilion, it was used. And, and so it, it, so it is sometimes it, it, it really uh, work it, it wor really works yeah. shall we um, open the discussion up any um, <coughs> questions uh, or comments uh, Johnny Mm. Uh, I don't know if you know Jean Hart. Well, that's in, in Leeds Town, but it's 
Hopefully we can find a better tool to find out some more conversation as well as to go to the point of the things that you can do for us mm. in the community as to who is blocking the path for your whole position. I think we, we the, in both cases, we used it for this collective production of texts. So that was the communal aspect, for example. This one was a project for the Sopot Festival of Regions, which is located in, in Lower Austria. And it's a very special festival, I think, in Austria, because it really works with collaborating with existing cultural institutions, with people, with restaurants, with not only cultural institutions. And for that project, we also worked, I think we prepared the texts during the whole year, you know, going back to villages, to the whole region, talking to different people, <coughs> collecting texts and so on. So let's say the text production plus the performance, of course, then was all done by local people, including the, um, what's it called, the fire squad. And I mean, including a lot of people who were living in, in the whole region. The problem with installing the megaphones, we were th thinking about that, if we could install them to be taken over by, by the community. The problem is that the, the technical aspect is quite fragile. You can't leave the amplifiers outside, you know. You, it, it's not like you, you have a, uh, some, some, some kind of looking glass and you just throw in a coin and you make it active. Mm -hmm. It's technically too, too fragile, can't be in the rain, so. Actually, it would only function if you hand it over to some kind of organization, which offered, let's say, the first Sunday a month or something like that. <coughs> and then people could join together. What, what we're um, uh, referring to, it would require a different type of installation, not, not in the open space if we talk about the... Uh, That's a know, question of money. Well, it's a technical... Uh, it's in the beginning, we thought we thought to to do that, but it would it would it would have been too too expensive. Yeah. And you need el electricity, so it usually works with battery packs. So you need to put the battery packs in the open space. So that's why it's possible. We've got a microphone here now. So um, do you have a comment? Thanks very much for the the talk. Um, fantastic examples, as, as Johnny said, I mean, really rich. I, I'm interested in this durationality aspect, um, the, the time it might take for an impact to emerge, either an expected one or an unexpected one, and how that crosses over with latency. That, that's, that's a nice concept. You were quite, forgive me, you were quite brief in your description of the project that to my ears, seem to have quite an immediate political impact and you are drawing a connection between an actual political outcome and some of the activist work that you were involved with. So if I picked that up correctly, I'm interested to know whether or not you anticipated that and having seen it happen, is there something tantalising for artist activists uh, witnessing that potency did that turn your attention to, well, hold on a minute, this doesn't have to be durational, poetic, over time. This can be now immediate and have immediate impact on a, on a political level. Can you say a bit more about that project and how surprised you were that how, how effective your work actually was? Which one are you referring to on normal and drought? Or yeah, yeah. yeah, the one that seemed to have an impact on, quite a direct impact on a political outcome. I mean, the, the, the Graz project was a um, very big one. I have to say, Paul is from Graz, so we've been involved in Graz in many different phases um, during our collaboration. We worked on a project for the um, Graz Cap European Capital of Culture 2003 for two years. <laughs> we were actually working for the lead project for youth culture and in the end it didn't happen so and many other i, w I was um, participating in the show last year at the kunsthaus 
Grass, which was dedicated to um, also how we want to live together, the future of Syria. So there was, we, we collaborated with a um, uh, curator from Graz also for that project. So there was a lot of, um, let's say, intensity already during <laughs> preparing the project. Then there was the pandemic. <laughs> then we had to reorganize uh, different elements. We postponed the first exhibition of, at the House of Architecture. We postponed three of the um, urban interventions, only the Oak Winter with the dance plant to be continued because we had already started with, with planting. So I think during that long process, um, a lot of discussions are, or the pandemic also had an impact on how the city experienced, let's say, the, um, how can I say, the pulverization of the year of culture, because it was meant as this big accumulation of, you know, density of projects, stretching it over a period of two years um, meant enormous effort of everybody involved. And I think that is um, a huge challenge for everybody. But at the same time, I think people started to think very basically about what do we need? What kind of qualities do we want in life? And I think that was part of also why this, um, this candidate from, from the Communist Party could win and why some of the projects of the um, year of culture are very resonating. So for example, I mean, I didn't mention all the details, but um, at the exhibition at the Forum Stadtpark, the now vice mayor came. <laughs> and that time, nobody believed that she would be the vice mayor. But she was interested in, in exactly that project. Um, so I think it was a, a combination of different moments in time. And this is something we have not yet mentioned in our um, conversation this evening, that in order to um, making things happen, I think there are a lot of different moments that need to come together in, in a specific situation. You, you have to have a certain, how can I say, lucky circumstances oftentimes. So sometimes you put, a l I mean, you invest an enormous energy and the result is poof. And sometimes mm. things fall together and all of a sudden you have this, this moment and you realize, wow, this actually really, really worked on a large scale. Um, I, but I can we can say that normal pushed a lot at the specific sites the yes. the development. I can say for the very complex situation for in Andritz where public works uh, worked and they re made really they, they analyzed that this this square couldn't work because there's too much uh, in on on one spot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, this was also already when the the, the, the square was planned twenty years ago. Uh, th this guy, this architect, this was a good architect. He he uh, thought, and this is also what what Andreas uh, immediately recognized: a super studio. You have to go up because you have too ma too much layers which came together. And but what happened is that they had one day where the where the 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 they made a, a zoom where they can where the the, the 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 traffic was blocked in a way that they have the pedestrian have uh, preferred have uh, preference. preference yeah so this is one and in in um, I think in in the south I think it's relatively was the question about the general political yes as, at this, as I think so this was a political decision after after that then I think we hope still in in that where we we worked with the with the Congress uh, that they that there's a long story <coughs> behind that from the urban um, that they destroyed the, the 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 traditional center in that district, yeah, and they will build up a new uh, uh, building, and they promised us that we can be we, we will be involved. So we don't know, but this was something we we got we got, and I think as well, uh, Barbara already mentioned in the lecture is that the 
in, the, in Wetzelsdorf with this urban gardening project. project. Uh, yeah, but I, uh, I want to, to, to bring that together. Uh, they will they will get for next season also a, 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 a spot plan. Fine. Uh, there's a, oh no, wait, there's a microphone coming in. Can I echo um, uh, Johnny and Ken's appreciation of your presentation and lecture? Uh, I certainly um, sort of take away the two uh, sort of propositions of uh, direct urbanism and silent activism. Um, there was a slide about five in that began VAS, W-A-S-S, and I just sort of noticed uh, dialogue is a word that I bandy around, perhaps too loosely, but I saw dialogue with uh, polylog. Um, I don't know if it's possible to go back to that slide or just you, you know what's on it. If you could say something more about that. Sorry for the, uh, <coughs> the business. <laughs> well, we only have to find. It was in a bubble. In a bubble. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Was it there? Ah, okay, yes, yes, yes. That's yeah. 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 Um, I, d I don't know if you can unpack that a little bit. Yeah, uh, I mean, we, we, we've been working a lot with um, how to create settings for non-hierarchical communication. And we didn't, I didn't explain that more into detail, but of course the whole setting for the congresses of the missing things is based on non-hierarchical communication. There is a website, um, it's um, www.missingthings.org, where you can also see the first and the second World Congress. And yeah, um, I think if you go back to the first World Congress, I actually created um, a thematic structure of tables, where rather than having this very unpleasant picture, you know, segmenting the shared and category and so on, what we're trying to do is add a setting for sharers to bring in food, to bargain, to consume, etc. So it's very much about um, having a communication on a deeper level, and I think it requires to create a social setting in order to produce that kind of communication. Right. And I think the word polylog was actually used for the first time when we designed this rhythmatic structure of tables. I think it's actually <coughs> having two, let's say, two groups of audiences. So, so. It's a very complex project. I'm not going into detail, but I can show you the tables. Here you see the tables. So um, that was the structure of the First World Congress. And then we put up the topics of the Congress on those small um, flags. And you can see the audience quite 
diverse. And that's what it looked like. And actually, the idea was to occupy that space in front of um, a subway station. It was a, a project dealing with a, a new arts district in the former lively city center of, of Baltimore, which was inhabited only by, by homeless drug addicts, ex-convicts. And the idea of Baltimore or this new arts district, which um, yeah, was realizing projects which were funded by the uh, NEA, National Endowment for the Arts, in the framework of creative pl placemaking, was to enhance the quarter, and the first signs of developers were already up. And so I decided to, put, to actually I developed that format of the Congress for that location. And when you see the people who participated in the Congress, you understand that they're not the usual experts who would be asked for a production of knowledge. So. Did, did, did you say that last, when you think the committee meeting, the one how I talk about, oh my, oh my. Um, <laughs> it feels like that's the, ba that's the basis of your work. That, that I mean, to me, that, that's what's so strong about it, that it's, uh, and I think you talked about the production of desires that you're you're communicating to people not with a, a an answer or with a manifesto, but with a it's the actual. Um, I mean, you also talk about something. I think the society of caring, and that's what you're representing through your projects, um, which I think is what, what makes them so moving and powerful. I mean that, and I just wondered if. You being a, um, there's two of you, so you're a collective and you're collaborators. I, is that is that a key to making such sort of non-egotistical interventions in the world? Because a lot of public art is quite, is artists sort of flexing their muscles quite a lot, you know. But y your work hasn't got, doesn't feel to me like it's got any of that. It really is about trying to open people's um, abilities up, you know, and maybe it ends up creating a mayor, and maybe it ends up in 15 years' time, uh, people uh, opening up people's ability to communicate. That's what it feels like. That's the key to it. And I wondered if the, the fact that you are collaborating is is, is part of that, um, or or enables you to to work in that way. I think it's the opposite. I think I'm extremely egotistical <laughs> all in a way as well, and that's how we meet. Yeah. We fight all the time. Yeah. And <laughs> then we have to find some kind of an agreement at a certain point. And of course, I agree. Our goal for the art project is to create those situations. But I think um, what we must not, how can I say, it, disguise is that, of course, by all kind of openness and open-ended process there are certain parameters that we set very clearly and there are certain aesthetic moments that we want to produce very clearly there are always objects who have which have a certain aesthetic so i mm. think um i'm i always have to make that very clear that artists are still not social workers but they're directors and we direct the situation we choreograph them so mm. but i think what you're just pointing out is very interesting and uh, our collaboration is um i don't know paul would probably disagree completely with what i've been saying but that's part of our collaboration and that's why the two of us already represent probably a wide range of all kinds of dispute <laughs> Yeah. Well, uh, well, there's, there's, uh, there's um, of course, a very uh, social engagement. And there's one part in our work we haven't shown here. And this is a part which I, I'm very responsible about it. This is the, this which goes in, in, into uh, architecture and urban, urban design. And we do also those projects with the same attitude. This is very important. We don't. We never will do office buildings or li something like that. So we have a we, but we we work also on a fee in a f in another field, with the same attitude, and with also with 
is parts of direct urbanism. That doesn't mean that those projects are direct urbanism. So we, for ourselves, we uh, um, distinguish uh, between between art projects, direct urbanism, and urban uh, urban design projects. Mm. And this is this is I think is very important for us. But at the end, they have to have the same social uh, engagement. This is this is very important, and I think it's also we come from another point from the first question uh, of uh, of Jasper uh, of the time, because when you have a long when you have an urban urban design project, you have a very long term time uh, frame, and I was ever ever never a, 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 a hated this yeah because it was it was always that that I said okay it, 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 this is too late we can't we don't know what will be in 15 years yeah we have mm -hmm. to do it now yeah and this is uh, something that we that, that, that for me I decided oh I have to go direct into the urban the urban context and to uh, intervene there yeah this is more important than to to draw and to draw like, like an idiot and have to make a next competition uh, project, which is in the, in the and, and I said, no, this is, this is meaningless, yeah? Mm. And so uh, from the, and then, so we also, we have this, this discussion in the, in the seven, in the 1990s, we, I already, with the death of Guy de Boer, I discovered uh, the, the citizenists. And so uh, it was clear that urbanism is something different than that what we we have learned in, in, in my studio, studios in, as an architect, yeah? that, that we can go with, with the psychogeography, that there's, there's much more which, which, is, which is, comes more from the art. Yeah? And this was the beginning also, also for our collaboration. Now explained, I think for, it's the same, but it's for the other way around we come, come now. Yeah. Uh, from this time, this time gap we have between now, uh, what we do have to do mm. now, and we, what we will do in future. Mm. Mm. But I think in the question you were raising about the public uh, public art, I think this also has to do with the situation in the UK. That oftentimes there's a lot of money, and the projects we're dealing with oftentimes don't have such large budget so mm. other different type of artists probably also engage there's no budget there's yeah no. yeah i want to uh, well we're finished by two but um i also wanted to ask you about this question of place because you know, you you're, you were saying a lot of your projects are situated within, you know, cities of culture, which in a sense kind of cooks up an environment and makes ready a space for you, your intervention. Are the, are the spaces that are, as you put it, kind of sealed off from the kind of work that you can do? I mean, have you found yourself in a situation where it's just not possible? to um, conduct this uh, idea of mm -hmm. direct urbanism um, because you know it's, there's a kind of porosity to these environments mm -hmm. isn't there um, the, 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 the cities are often quite small um, and like I say they're, they're part of a larger infrastructure for, for art you know um, making communities ready for artists like you to appear and invite them to kind of participate you know, what does it mean to work outside of that environment? Can you take these same uh, concepts of silent activism, direct urbanism into other spheres too? Yeah, I think we have, first of all, we have to um, differentiate between um, if exactly, if the projects are commissions, um, who is the commissioning mm. party if the projects are self-initiated or if the projects respond to an open call for example Graz normal was an open call um, and then i think it's it i can't say i mean honestly i when when i got this invitation from baltimore i was really 
hesitant. I, I really saw that if I don't come up with a really strong proposal, then I can't do anything in that context. And then I had um, a very harsh Skype meeting. I remember it was the 2nd of January. So I think it was right after the holidays. Um, with the head of the person who was responsible for that program in, in Baltimore after I had sent her my proposal and I was very outspoken in my proposal. I really mentioned the topic of um, redistribution of wealth as um, a main goal of the Congress of the Muslim Saints in that location in Punjab. And I thought, I mean, either sh she responds or she, I mean, take it or leave it. And then we have that Skype meeting and I said that again very clearly. You know, either you provide that open platform for us developing that Congress plus setting up a Congress office. I mean, it was really big, big project. Um, or, I mean, you don't need to take it, but there is, uh, as a basic setting, there is no compromise. Then we can discuss, you know, I mean, I have no idea of the topic that will be submitted and all those things. And I think that's how I would, yeah, what would I still, I mean, that's the basis of my working and thinking. And um, sometimes I'm not very diplomatic, so <laughs> then. I'm, I'm the diplomatic guy. <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> yeah, this is, uh, <laughs> makes things clear right yeah. from the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, Tom. Hi, just to kind of follow on from that point, um, one of the things that struck me on the last project is um, planting the apple trees where it hurts. And I wonder if that is a theme that extrapolates for your projects in general. In a sense, are you looking for the places of conflict? pre-existing in the places that you're operating in or it sounded a little bit like in the Baltimore case that you were kind of bringing a, um, um, some conflict perhaps yourself and I guess yeah I'm just interested in where you feel the hurt comes into the wider projects um, and how you work with that. Thanks for this great question, really. I think it was the first time that somebody put it in, in that way. Really, really great question. What we didn't show today was um, this one artistic strategy, which is my favorite one, which Paul doesn't like at all. It's um, conflict as productive force. So actually, <laughs> you hit the point. Um, I really think I'm, it's not that I would be looking for situations of conflict, but um, I think what I find really important is when I engage in that kind of um, urban public situations, I always ask myself in the beginning, what can I contribute that I think is meaningful? What can I contribute rather than just doing a project? What, what could I what could my project contribute in a way that I would feel content with afterwards? And oftentimes this um, addresses situations where there is already some kind of difficulty or some kind of conflict where I think, okay, this makes sense to address that from a different angle, not from a political angle, not from the community angle, but from the angle of an artist coming with a different kind of approach, not pleasing, not following expectations, you know, like really uprooting sometimes um, expectations. And oftentimes with that different approach, shaking a little bit, um, maybe harsh positions and, and finding <coughs> a completely different um, way of addressing a situation. I'm not so, I mean, it's really an interesting question to think about situations um, where there was not maybe 
I mean, for example, for the the Lietzen project, which we did not show, the question was, um, the city center had emptied out because um, they had built a huge dog of shopping malls around that small city. And the, the shopkeepers from the city center, they had approached public arts theory um, to ask some artists to deal with those empty storefronts. And then the curator of public arts theory approached us and said, look, um, Barbara and Paul, are you interested in that topic? And then we said, we're interested in that topic, but we're definitely not going to find any kind of um, programs for the empty storefronts. <laughs> but if we deal with the issue, we really want to put that in relationship to that they produce the problems themselves. If you sell off your, your agricultural field in order to build shopping malls, of course, for a city of 10,000 inhabitants, that has a consequence on the small inner city. The same project I explained with the gar with the park, park. Mm -hmm. the park that at the, the end this project is successful. And I would say to me it always the we is more important than the I. Yeah, this is uh, what what I, I, I where we have sometimes also the conflict that I'm I'm not so much the artist in our collaboration. So I'm more the doing uh, uh, guy in, in a way. So we have sometimes this is also the the and uh, as an artist, I think you have to have a, a big, a big, uh, um, really big uh, uh, desire. desire, yeah. And and for me, it's sometimes more to to uh, to look for collaborations, not especially for conflicts. Conflicts are something which is in in a context or not, yeah, or is in the situation more. I would say, yeah. And this is uh, this is uh, this is. Uh, so, so I, I would never look for that, but if there is a conflict, it is clear we have to we have to work with that. Yeah, but this is this is totally clear. We can, we can. And that was also this project was also a really good example because one of the shopkeepers then she was very open minded, and we went back to the curator and said, "Look, I think we can really develop that concept of the commons. You know, producing this, I was uh, we produce this pavilion as a collective sculpture." selling off tangram pieces um, to, to a very small amount of money so that the residents would have to buy the tangram pieces in order to make use of the pavilion because only then the pavilion would be empty for use. So it was a very complex <laughs> uh, constellation. And then this one shopkeeper approached us and, and she was really into it. And then we said, we went back to the curate and said, look, I mean, we're really lucky, good group of people. and. And then he said, well, are you aware of, um, I don't know if I should tell you, but I think I have to tell you, she's from the right-wing party. She's a member of parliament from the right-wing party. And I didn't want to say that in the beginning, but are you sure you want to, you know, collaborate? And, and then we said, afterwards. and then we said, yes. Because since she's open-minded towards our our proposal, then that's a perfect constellation. But this was at the end of the in, in the middle of the project. In the middle of, of the, the project. project, yeah. When the project was already uh, more or less in, in set up. Okay. Put the microphone behind you. Thank you both very much for um. The wonderful presentation. I'm I'm interested, uh, as an architect sitting in this room, I'm very interested to know just how would you present your practice within the different environment that might be a school of architecture? Because <laughs> I find myself, uh, it, I find it harder and harder to practice an architect in relation to the fact that there's a kind of degree of permanence to what we do that I feel quite uncomfortable doing. And I think we can learn a lot from the kind of the now in, in what you do, but I'd just be interested to know, would you frame this kind of presentation differently in a School of Architecture? Thank you, I think uh, I think this is a question for me, yeah? <laughs> well, I had a presentation yesterday, so I have uh, uh, for a university in Oldenburg, I have VR, VR video, I 
had a presentation for for our architects for young for talk a short talk and i think it's it's not so so uh, uh, different uh, how, how we present because I, I already mentioned that we do it with the same attitude and i say i have also to say thank you uh, to here to london to to uh, when i started my my work there was Robert Mull, and maybe you know him. He supported us very, very well in the beginning, and he, uh, from his uh, in his conversation, I understood. I understood this is not you can you can do that. You can bring those things together if you have a clear attitude. Yeah, and uh, I think we always when I when I present architecture uh, in in the audience of architects. The projects I always uh, uh, show also uh, in my talk one or two projects of direct urbanism. It's totally clear because it ma makes more understandable the decisions we uh, we do also in in architecture. And we do I think mainly projects with uh, with uh, um, uh, participation uh, with. Uh, or we, we do now, we do the, the, uh, the landscape architecture project together with the people there or something something like that. This is, this is uh, uh, or, or we work with, with topics, with, with, with uh, um, immigration. Uh, we have a project where we people will help people can live together with, uh, with a background of migration. And so we have we have a lot of topics, and we do that with competitions, which is a bit which is very very hard. But the uh, the 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 advantage is that we have then a position. So because we won with the topic, the competition, and then we can do that. It's not possible when you go to a private client and you want to do. Uh, something like a family house, what we don't do, and then it's not possible. But those projects we do, and this is a luxury, and I know that. Yeah, we can we can do that in, with the same with the same uh, power as as we do the art project art production. Okay, so it's five to eight. I wonder, unless there's any Belgian. Questions for anyone waiting to say anything? Maybe we should take the discussions as a draft out. <laughs> um, we've got good numbers here. If we go to the pub together and uh, continue, um, I know you're going to stay on for that, so please join us. Um, and just uh, once again, thank you for your talk. Yes, please join us.